Welcome to the No Big Deal Podcast. I am your host, joined today by journalist, author, uh, Gary Meese. Gary has written um, three different books on the West Memphis Three, Blood on uh, Blood on Back, is that correct? Blood on Black. Blood on Black, Blood on Back. Black. Blood on Black, Where the Monsters Go, and then a compilation of the case against the West Memphis Three, which I have read, and it is a phenomenal um, book, very detailed. Uh, how you doing today, Gary? I'm great. Good. Hey, so, you know, I want to apologize formally uh, for messing up our last uh, go at this. <laughs> I, I okay. you know I, I lost a lot of stuff so and and I yours was the yours was the most important one because the other stuff is just you know but I'm so uh, thank you so much for uh, talking to me again and um, um, a lot of since the last time that we we talked you and I a lot has developed on my YouTube channel. Um, I mean I'm getting blown up left and right with comments on both sides of this whole. Uh, argument about the West Memphis Three and um, so many defenders and so many you know de- naysayers who want to throw doubt in with the little bit of shred of whatever they think they have against you know people like Hobbs and um, and uh, so I- I'm really excited to talk to you today. You started writing about this case uh, about how long ago? Well, I was working at the uh, the West Memphis Evening Times back in 2010, 2011, 12, 13, 14. And so I had begun writing, the, writing about the case in uh, 2011, I would say. And what was it that that fascinated you about this case to where you've dedicated so much of your time to, to well, writing about it? And initially, it was just a journalistic task. I'd gotten a, a copy of a, a letter that uh, the parents, some of the parents of the dead children, uh, and the dead children are Christopher Byers, Michael Moore, and Stevie Branch. Uh, Some of the parents had written a letter to the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences to protest an Emmy Emmy nomination, or an Oscar nomination, rather, for uh, Paradise Lost 3. And uh, so I was just handling that as a matter of course and reading through their letter to the Academy. It struck me that these parents had never really had their side of the case even explained to the public in any kind of fair and comprehensive way. And I don't know that at that point I actually, uh, uh, I don't, I'm sure I didn't at that point decide, oh, I'm going to write some books about this. But, uh, you know, I did, I did run a story about their letter and then, you know, that's, it's, things sort of progressed from there. And I looked, I looked more deeply into the case and the more I saw, the more I s- perceived that they had not only a really valid complaint about the distortion, distortions in the Paradise Lost movies, which are profound, but just generally that uh, the the guilty side of this is just simply never was never told to the in the mass media at all. It's always been, it, and it continues that way. There very very few instances are you going to find any sort of reference to the West Memphis Three that doesn't. Attach something like wrongly convicted he, to the, to the case, even though they were convicted in, by a jury, it's upheld on appeal, and they pled guilty in the end. So let's uh, let's start with the the day that the boys went missing, um, and so we'll go ahead and start where uh, I believe it was was that May? Uh, what day was that exactly? May 5th, 1993. May 5th, 1993, uh, West Memphis, Arkansas. Um, Christopher, um, Stevie, and Michael all go missing. Um, And there's a scramble to find these boys immediately. They're found the next day. Was it the very next day when the boys were found that Damien was brought in? And let's talk about... Let's talk about... um, Damien, and let's talk about um, uh, 
Oh, Jason and Jesse. Je- well, well, Jesse specifically with the confessions. We'll, we'll we'll start with, let's start with who who got picked up first, and then the the confessions. We'll, we can well, discuss that. They, they weren't okay. Number one, they weren't picked up. Uh, Davian wasn't picked up, uh, and Jesse Miskelly wasn't was not even considered even remotely as any sort of suspect until he actually confessed to the to the crimes. But what happened was uh, the, bo- the three little boys were found the next day. They were uh, found nude. Uh, they were dunked. In, they were tied up in a strange fashion with left left wrist to left ankle, uh, right wrist to right ankle. All three of them uh, by shoestrings and that placed a- in the water. They'd been stripped naked. One of the boys was essentially castrated. Another boy. His face was mutilated, and they were all, of course, they were all drowned. Uh, they were obviously beaten up pretty badly, uh, and their clothes had been st- cr- uh, stuck down into the mud with sticks. And uh, so a lot of searchers had walked essentially right past these bodies without in this little ditch without realizing what was in there. And I say little ditch, it was two or three feet deep, a little bit deeper uh, toward one end as it got down to a larger drainage canal that's actually quite large called 10 mile bayou have you been out there yeah yeah i've been out there yeah well, uh, so when uh, they were tied at, up, at that time i've been out there the, it, the 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 woods had already been cleared off i did not go out there right initially and and uh and i've been by 10 mile bayou a zillion times uh but uh, I've been actually out on the site. Yeah, there's not much there now. Right. Well, the, so the way that they were tied up, you said they were tied up oddly. It, it wasn't much of a. The they were tied. Uh, explain exactly how they were tied up. So they were tied up. One was tied up, uh, or they were all tied, left hand to was it left hand to left foot? Left, the left hand to left foot and right hand, right wrist to right ankle. Ankle. Yeah. So yeah. So ankle. So. <laughs> it's sometimes referred to as hog tying, but hog tying would be left ankle to right wrist, yeah. and so there would be a crossover effect, and you would really be incapacitated from moving. Uh, the way they were tied up, it would be if you were conscious, it would be pretty easy to just—I mean, you could move around and untie yourself and be gone. So it's obvious. Obviously, they were tied up after they had been. Um, incapacitated they apparently were you know there are some defensive wounds but they were apparently overcome very quickly uh, because there weren't a lot of defensive wounds and uh, so you know the the idea was that they but two of the boys drowned so they were knocked out but they had not they weren't dead until they were placed in the water so obviously they were apparently knocked out Whoever was doing this was not doing this, this tying was not doing this to incapacitate movement, but had some other purpose in mind. It's just not clear what that purpose was. It struck that in the nudity and the placing in the water. Uh, it, it, it all struck the officers initially. Is very, it is very strange and it struck officers as being somewhat ritualistic, which and arguably it, it is. You can argue about what kind of ritual might be involved, but the tying in partic- tying of the of the hands and the feet in particular is just strange and otherwise not explained as, except as some sort of action on the part of the killer where he's trying to, where he or they are trying to resolve some sort of situation in their own minds because they didn't serve any purpose to tie obvious purpose to tie the boys this way do you think that it was uh from somebody who obviously they didn't know what they were doing maybe oh they knew what they were doing but the way that they they tied them they so they tied them so you believe that they tied them that way purposely uh that it was part of the ritual that what was happening there was some sort of ritual going on whether they were i'm gonna be agnostic on whether there was actually some sort of occult ritual as such going on at the time. Yeah, uh, I, I'm not saying that because I don't think the evidence proves that one. It doesn't disprove it, and it doesn't prove it. However, I, I will say that it struck the investigators at the time 
as appearing ritualistic. And of course, you had the setting, and the, you know, was it night when the boys went, went? It was very late in the evening, really at night when the boys went missing, and there was a full moon. So there were certain aspects of it that right away struck uh, the investigators as being possibly ritualistic. Now they went out looking at all sorts of people, and you know, which is what you do whenever you have uh, a, a murder. And with a, a, an unknown assailant, or an un, you know, they don't know who it is. There's no like, there's no really likely suspects. You know, you you go down the list of who might have been involved in this, and they went out and they talked to, checked out many many people. And among those many people they checked out was Damian Eccles. And the reason they checked him out because he had. Uh, uh, a history of uh, violent behavior. He was violently mentally ill. He was, uh, it's three times in the previous year, he'd been locked up in mentalist, and you don't see any of this in any of the movies. He'd been locked up uh, in mental institutions on three different occasions for various forms of violent acting out. And uh, he had, you know, he was on Social Security disability for being mentally ill, and in his Social Security disability uh, application, he described himself as homicidal, so it's suicidal, what yada yada, other manic depressive, schizophrenic. I think he said alcoholic somewhere, a drug addict. I think somewhere, and he also described himself as sociopathic. So you got a guy who's on the front end is describing himself on an official government document as a homicidal sociopath. Do you believe he was all of those things? Uh, yeah. I, 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 whether he's clinically a sociopath or not is probably, a, uh, you could argue about whether he actually fulfills all the requirements, but certainly his, his actions are sociopathic. He might have a, you know, somebody with a really skilled diagnostic skills might be able to pin him down on something else. The problem, is, I mean, every time he went, to, every time he went to talk to somebody, and he was also the very day he, that these killings occurred, he was in, uh, he was actually continuing uh, counseling at the local mental health center. And the very day, the psychiatrist had seen him, and he said he had a tendency to uh, impulsive and dangerous actions that very day. So, but uh, you know, th th these various. Mental hospitals had diagnosed him with a variety of ills, as they tend to do. He defied easy classification, but he also freaked out the other other patients at the mental institutions. Um, and and when he was in Oregon, there was one one time he was in Oregon. His parents had, long story there. His parents had moved there, and he was there briefly with them. Uh, he threatened to, you know, cut his mother's throat. He threatened to eat his father with a spoon. He goes to the, goes to the hospital there, and one of the doctors there, with the psychiatrist, suggested that he was just faking all this for attention. And I do think there's a certain aspect to that. that As he, do I. He was doing this, uh, but uh, he also described hallucinations. Uh, he described his. Uh, he believed in uh, the. Intrinsic power of there was power in blood, and that he drank blood to obtain power. And so, you know, you're looking at a case where, and that uh, you're looking at a case where, you know, there was some bloodletting involved. Anyway, How, so he was, he was by no means he was by no means the only suspect. Yeah, but he well, wasn't I, picked up. Or when I say I'm not saying picked up, he wasn't brought up by random either. That's that's extremely important to. Realize they, I mean, he fit kind of the sadistic, you know, right. killer that right. they were looking for. He fit a profile very, very well. And then they started working from that, from, from you know, right. the outside right. in. Well, and, right. Well, what happened there was they, they did go to, that, the, the boys were went missing on a Wednesday. They were found on a Thursday afternoon. After a very intensive search, Friday, uh, a, a juvenile de detention officer that was familiar with him and a police officer went by his his uh, his home in West Memphis, and where he was living with his parents and talked to him briefly. Didn't really take extensive notes, 
and we're just sort of checking him out. Um, and there wasn't re- nothing really much came of that. But uh, they talked to him again on Sunday. At Sunday, uh, he gave. They were using by that point. They were using an FBI checklist of suggested questions to determine, uh, you know, likely suspects. He gave very suspicious answers to these questions. Jason Baldwin also answered quite a few. His friend Jason Baldwin answered quite a few of these questions before his mother showed up and absolutely insisted that he not talk to police. But Damien had gone on and answered these questions and said such things as the, uh, the, the, the killer would have enjoyed hearing the boy scream, that he would have been happy about the results of his killing, that he uh, would have been, you know, he, that he was going to be quite satisfied with this. Yeah. Uh, you know, a, a lot of stuff that, you know, he, here's an 18-year-old high school dropout living in a trailer park in West Memphis, Arkansas, of all places. And, you know, he's got the, this insight into how such a killer would think. This raised suspicions in officers. They bring him in the next day, bring him in the next day and talk to him. Uh, again, he, you know, he, he, he's changing, he's also changing his alibi times around. So there was that problem. And then they give him a polygraph test. He fails the polygraph. He insists that he'll talk if they'll just bring his mother in. They bring his mother in and he says, well, I'm not going to tell y'all anything. Yeah. So he was ready to confess, right? That was the, that was the deal. He gave it that impression, but he he didn't do that. No, he never he never did. But he said that he was like, okay, I'll tell you what you guys want to know. I just want to talk to my mom. His mom gets in there, basically tells him keep your mouth shut, and then change and then so that changed the course of the way that you know that interrogation right. went. But he was he was ready to he like you said he gave the impression that he was ready to give it all up. Yeah, he gave that impression, but also it also happened in those two days on the May 9th and May 10th is the West Memphis police had gotten a tip from a, a woman named who lived in Lakeshore Trailer Parks who was sort of relatives with Damien's pregnant 16-year-old girlfriend, Dominique Teer, who knew Damien, and she said that she and her other family members had seen him walking along the the service road, because there's a service road. This woods where the boys were killed is right by the interstate. The only thing between the woods, the woods that were there, that aren't there now but were then, and the, the interstate was a service road running parallel to the, the interstate. And she was driving along the service road that evening, about 9.20 that night. Boys went missing around, last seen around 6.30, and saw Damien, and she assumed was her so-called relative, Dominique Tear, uh, on the side of the road in muddy clothes. And so police, that she, she said this on Sunday. By Monday, she'd come in and given an interview with the police and it reiterated that story. Uh, this story was... She had two other family members who backed her up completely on this, her son Anthony and her her daughter. I can't think of the little girl's name right now, but her daughter also uh, agreed with her mother's story. And her husband her husband said that, uh, you know, he'd seen somebody by the side of the road. He just couldn't identify who it was. So they had two th- – they had those things. They had, you know, Damien Eccles, already a likely suspect. He gives suspicious answers to – uh, uh, an FBI checklist examination. Uh, he can't account for his whereabouts. He fails a polygraph, and he's seen by somebody on the side of the. He's seen by somebody who knows him. Several people who know him on the side of the road, uh, in muddy clothes, very close to where the killings occurred on the evening of the killings. That is why he became a prime suspect. They didn't just arbitrarily pick him out of the air or decide let's go let's go get the kid that wears black T-shirts and listens to Metallica, which is the theory that's off, most often presented with this. The fact is, is there were plenty of people wearing black T-shirts. Uh, the officer who went to one of the officers who went to interview uh, Damien and uh, Jason at Jason's trailer on Sunday 
at the time was wearing a black Grim Reaper t-shirt himself. It wasn't unusual for people to be wearing black concert t-shirts in West Memphis, Arkansas. Uh, he, uh, and as far as their musical taste, how would the officers even know that they were Metallica fans? Well, it's absurd. And, and, that's, and that's funny, too, because in 1993, Metallica was in the prime of their popularity, really. I mean, and they had been. Oh yeah, they were. They huge. were a big band. A, 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 I mean, a huge, huge superstars. They really. were the only. They're and the they, only band they, to they ever. Were, they'd been playing concerts over in West Memphis for. I mean, they've been playing concerts in Memphis for several years, and uh, and Mem- Memphis and West Memphis are maybe ten. It's about ten miles or so. Yeah. Uh, to really get, to get from one place to another, but they're very close. Yeah, uh, it's separated by a big river and a whole lot of floodlands, but uh, th- otherwise they're basically side by side. Metallica is su- was such a big band at the time. They had per- they're the only still to this day the only band in the world to perform on all seven continents, including Antarctica. So to 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 say that their musical taste was strange is a flat out lie. Yeah, because exactly. I loved exactly. Metallica then too. Well, I. I believe around that time I was actually going to a pool hall or something over in Memphis where they continuously played yeah. Metallica, yeah. which wasn't really my, I, I mean, I wasn't going there to listen sure. to Metallica or even care, but I just, I just remember hearing it. Everywhere. Yeah. Cause they were super popular. So that is, the whole Metallica thing is, is a lie. And, um, yeah, so that, 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 that's all they had to really like, Oh, we're, we're, picked on kids who are outcasts because we listen to Metallica. It's like, no, everybody listens to Metallica. So right. we can we can dispel they, that. Right. The, the West Memphis police did continue. They ha- did have a list of suspicious people. They, they There's a, a long list of alternatives that they talked to uh, are people they tried to check out including uh, various hitchhi- suspicious hitchhikers that were dropped off, a suspicious hitch- hitchhiker that was dropped off in the area, a guy who took a cab basically from West Memphis all the way to the, to, to the middle of Tennessee and paid like $200 for the cab ride, uh, uh, the, the infamous Mr. Bojangles, who was a, a, a black guy who was uh, incoherent, uh, had his arm in a cast, and he was at a fried chicken restaurant uh, about a mile, mile and a half away from the crime scene that evening. Uh, disappeared when the police sh- before the police showed up. Was he bleeding he'd gone that in, profusely? He'd gone into the women's ba- restroom and had basically bled somewhat and uh, and defecated there, and kind of spread that around. And was incoherent in there. The the manager calls the police and says, "You know, come get this guy out of here." But by the time that the police the police woman had come, and she was this, uh, she Regina Meeks, who was the same officer who was taking the reports of the missing children. By the time she got there, he was already gone. She did make a a brief attempt to determine where he might have been, but there were some woods directly behind that area. It was they're frequented by a lot of vagrants. Uh, and she, you know, she couldn't find the guy, didn't spend a lot of time there. She didn't know she had a, a murder on her hands. Uh, as far as she was concerned, this was a slightly weirder than usual, but you know, it's a, one of those nuisance calls that police deal with constantly yeah homeless people walk around bleeding and casts all the time i mean it's a it's just a common thing it really is oh well it it, it sounds like a joke but yeah it's true even it, in Ca- like true. come to yeah, it, look california is notorious if i don't see a if i don't see a homeless stammering person that's bleeding around i don't feel at home you know i mean but i i get I, so it's right on the interstate so interstates are notorious for serial killers to move in and Correct. out so and there was a there was a large and there was a large truck wash uh, called the Blue Beacon and a Loves truck stop that was right next, basically right next door to these woods. And you know we can't absolutely preclude the possibility that perhaps there was some sort of very sophisticated serial killer who went in there on his own and killed these boys. It's certainly possible there, but there's no, there's really no evidence to show that anywhere. 
I, and, that's the thing. You and, say that it's possible. I would say the opposite. You I, say it's not possible. Not not with not with all the evidence that against the the. Yeah, I it mean, would have. They would have to be one of these. It's one of those cases where it's not Dexter. If they're innocent, they are the unluckiest people in the world. <laughs> oh, but like <laughs> the most unlucky. I mean, that it, it yes, would just be. Exactly. It would be asinine to have that many things stacked up against you. Uh, exactly. And, and I would say that. I would say that on the opposite. They. I think that they got lucky that there wasn't. They didn't leave more evidence. Like more physical evidence behind um by 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 strokes of luck if, if, if that's how i feel about it well i i will say this part of what i i think is under underappreciated with damien eccles is he'd been spending years contemplating such scenes he describes in his own book uh, Life after death he describes reading a, a book on uh, witchcraft and being really, really impressed with the uh, various trials that the Salem and tortures that the Salem witches went through, and that he spent many evenings drifting off to sleep with those images going through his head, I would argue that some of that was a, a rehearsal for the, the events of May fifth, nineteen ninety three. In other words, it, unlike the average teenage kid who might read that and get the shutters for a day or two, he was obsessing on this. He was obsessed with the occult at the time. He'd been obsessed with the occult for years before that, from at least preteen years, according to his own accounts, and he continues to be obsessed with the occult today. So wherever there was an, whether there was an actual occult intent at the at, in, involved in the commission of these killings is is it, it can be argued but I would also I would argue that the, that his fantasy life that involved these kinds of uh, tortures affected ha, inf, influenced how he handled these bodies is, is it also true that his mother was into witchcraft as well <laughs> I hear that so often from so many people <coughs> that I'm going to assume it's true, even though I really, I, I don't have any objective uh, evidence to, to, to substantiate that. And in fact, she was asked about her own uh, religious beliefs, and she said that she was at least a Christian. I believe she actually said she was a Baptist, but I think she, I know she said she was a Christian. And, and that she didn't really have any sympathy for Damien's uh, practices, I, but apparently she also bought him t uh, tarot cards uh, for his 18th birthday. Oh, so how nice! So you know she was that that family is ex extraordinarily screwed up, and who knows what the actual truth is? It was very hard to get straight answers from anybody in that family about any events that occurred. Uh, you know, they talked to the, uh, the the events in Oregon where he made threats to the family. They were all over the place with that incident, except it's clear that it was scary enough to them, parents, that they said Damien could not come home, that he had to go back to Arkansas. They were uh, There were younger children in the house, and they feared for the safety of those children. This was months before he committed these murders. So in the months leading up to the murders, and Damien had ex has exhibited all this strange behavior, uh, you know, the mental institutions filing his nails to a point, trying to claw out the eyes of a, a student that he went to school with, setting fires at school. Uh, I even read in your book, which I found completely disturbing, uh, which I find most of the things <clears throat> that you talk about about Damien disturbing, but one especially is that he was wearing a cat skull around his neck to school. Um, yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, these things he, aren't uh, normal. No, he, he really hates that this anecdote has been told, but the anecdote stems from Jason Baldwin's cousin who offered this unsolicited to the police that Damien and this, this cousin of uh, Jason Baldwin's, 
his, his fellow killer were out one afternoon close to the trailer park of Lakeshore States where Jason and Dominie lived. And there was a, a sick uh, black Great Dane, and Damien went up to the dog and killed it, mutilated it, just beat it to death, mutilated it, and apparently just did it for the sheer fun of it. Well, you know, uh, he, he also describes he also was described as torturing frogs uh, and uh, sticking firecrackers up the ass of cats, etc., cetera, yeah. etc. Cetera. So <clears throat> he was doing a lot of very sadistic things to animals, and he doesn't like that being said because, frankly, he's got a lot of cat ladies that are following him around, googling over his wonderful sayings. <laughs> Yeah, that's his YouTube audience. Yes, yes, exactly. You know, and and that's another thing is that so these are all classic signs of what leads up to people becoming a serial killer. And I fully believe that Damien was on his way to being a serial killer. Um, and you know, it's just like Jeffrey Dahmer that he started out killing very small rodents. Um, and then it grew into bigger and bigger. So, so Damien fits the, the profile from, you know, early, uh, early adulthood, you know, teenage years, uh, he, he, he fits that profile and that's what, that's what F that's what the FBI profilers are, are looking for. Right. So, right. So he, he kills this great Dane and I'll go even further. I heard that he, he had, he had gutted the, the thing and, and was playing with its intestines is what I, I uh, uh, read. Yeah. Suppose, supposedly he was walking around with the intestines draped around his shoulders. Would you put that past him? <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, exactly. As, as weird as that is to say, I, 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 I believe it. And, uh, there were people that witnessed this. So, so let's jump to, um, they, so they want to get to Jesse. They want to talk to Jesse. They don't believe Jesse had anything to do with that. Is that correct? Or have anything to do with Jesse? This? Jesse was not even on the radar. And uh, he, uh, what, the, the first, I think the first real mention perhaps of Jesse would have been an interview with Dominique's former girlfriend, Dominique, uh, uh, Deanna Holcomb, who uh, described her and Damien is both being involved in black magic. She repudiated at that point, but she said they'd both been involved in black magic. Magic. Uh, she was pretty sure he committed the crimes. That he was. Uh, she had broken up with him because she had come to learn that she he and they were talking about having a child, and his intention was to sacrifice the child in, a, in an occult ritual. Well, and this so, is what she told police. So and, they, you say that. And so and so, um, where where did we start with this? <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm sorry. So, so he was going to sacrifice the yeah. So we're, we're talking about we're talking about uh, Jesse. He wasn't on the the radar. No, he wasn't on the radar. But she, she mentioned Jesse as being a friend of Damien's. But other than that, he wasn't really on the radar. They knew Jason. He and Jason Baldwin hung. He was two years younger, lived over in Lakeshore Estates, which was this trailer park in between Marion and West Memphis, and uh, which is also where Dominique Tier lived. It's a very, it's quite a large trailer park, and it's it's uh, really was really run down then. Uh, Thirty years later, it's much more run down now, but it was not a nice place to live then. Uh, I've lost track again. Um, yep. So we're we're just talking about Jesse. Uh, Jesse, Jesse, Jesse. Okay, Jesse lived in another trailer park across the way called Highland Highland Park, which was on the other side of yet another interstate over there. You have to understand two two interstates come together at right at, right in West Memphis. I fifty five from the north and I forty east west. Uh, they were just they were talking to various people who knew uh, Dom. Uh, Damien, uh, over this next month, trying to get more information on him. Uh, they talked to uh, 
One one young guy had come forward who knew a teenager had come forward named William Jones who testified or told police that uh, Damien had confessed being involved in the killings to him one night when he was drunk. And then the next day he said, oh, well, I, I was drunk. I didn't mean any of that. But William Jones thought that he actually was sincere in his confession of, of sorts. And, and police were told about this. So that was yet another thing that was working against him over this month. What had happened was, there were, this is real complicated how this lady named Victoria Hutchison got involved in the case. She just happened to be at the Marion Police Department getting a, 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 a matter straightened out over a, trying to get a matter straightened out about a check that she supposed, or some money she supposedly embezzled from this place she worked. Whenever the police there got the call that the boys had been found and they were dead. Well, she was there with her eight year old son, Aaron Hutchison. Aaron was friends with the boys who were dead and had often gone to play in those woods. Just a huge coincidence. Why, you know, the idea that this mother's even bringing this eight year old into the police station while she clears up criminal matters is already pretty outrageous. Yeah. <laughs> Didn't know it's pretty bad parenting skills, but anyway. Well, I don't, so she's there. Yeah. So the police, the police find out the 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 the, the officer in in uh, Marion finds out. Oh, you know, th this kid actually knows these other kids. Well, maybe he can tell us something. Well, Aaron Hutchison never really told anything of any of any great value to police, but there were many 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 interviews with Aaron, and they were all pretty outrageous, and they got just more so with time. However, Vicki Hutchison decided that she was going to conduct her own investigation into this. She had moved from being a neighbor of uh, the Moores and the uh, Byers family in West Memphis. She had moved to the same trailer park as Jesse Muskelly. She was hanging out with Jesse all the time. He was cutting her grass. He, she was doing odd jobs for her. So, and she knew that he knew Damien. So she set this deal up where she was going to get Jesse to introduce her to Damien, claiming she thought he was hot and all this. She's like 30 years old. This kid's like 18. He's not, not, he's not hot. No, he wasn't hot, but, you know, <laughs> she, she thought he might buy into this. And oh, yeah. so, and so there, was, there was some interaction between them. Uh, at, when it came to, to trial, she... Miss Kelly's trial, she testified she went to an occult ritual with him, which people make a big deal out of. It had very little to do with Jesse's confession, and she did not testify at the Baldwin Eccles trial. They were two separate trials. So she was not that important as a witness. What was important here is that she made the connection for the police between Damien and Jesse Miss Kelly Jr. Well, it had been almost a month. June 3rd, 19, uh, 1993, police say, well, let's go talk to Jesse Miskelly and see what he knows about Damien Eccles. They'd already talked to plenty of his other friends. So they brought him into the police station. He's in there for a little while. They had some, you know, he gets permission from his, his father to talk to police. And he's in there, uh, and there's paperwork to fill out starting around 10. And by 12.30 or so, He's told this this story that you know he doesn't you know Damien's weird maybe he did it et cetera et cetera but certainly nothing incriminating. They give him a polygraph test. He fails the polygraph test. Damien's failed the polygraph test. Right. Jason's failed the polygraph test. Now Jason won't Jason won't take a polygraph test. Okay, so so you said oh, so, sorry you said so they they confront the, the police confront. Uh, uh, Jesse with yes. results of this polygraph test, and he breaks down very quickly and begins telling uh, a story about how he witnessed the killing of these three boys by Damien and Jason, and he describes his own participation, but he certainly minimizes that participation. Gary, let, and, me, let me sneak in here real quick. Uh, you, so it, Jason was the one that refused to take the polygraph test, but Damien... And Jesse both failed, correct? Correct. Okay. I just wanted to make sure that was straight because I think we said that Jason and 
Damien had failed, but it he Jason no, had I, refused. I, I didn't. I don't think I said that. But anyway, no, Jason. Jason absolutely. His mother absolutely refused to have him have anything to do with the police investigation whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I would have to say this was highly. Uh, he's perfect. His perfect right to do that. However, I would say it was highly unusual in the context of this investigation. They talked to a lot of other kids, including kids who. I say kids, they were teenagers mostly, but teenagers who had heavily involved in various criminal act activities who were under a great as much suspicion as Jason Baldwin at that point, who talked to police, who willingly subjected themselves to polygraphs and were released from those pol released as partially in the basis of the polygraphs, partially when they told police, and Jason refused. So he has a right to refuse to participate in the investigation, but it does raise suspicions when you do that. So he was under suspicion for that, among other things. That prompted some of the suspicion from the police. Here's a kid who doesn't want to tell us anything. What's he hiding? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Jason, so Jesse uh, confesses to the crime. Um, it's been misstated, you know, it's been mischaracterized and misstated about the, the length of the interrogation. It wasn't a 12-hour interrogation. He wasn't coerced. He, uh, he's not very intelligent, and uh, he, was, he was somewhat halting in his descriptions, so there were some leading questions. Uh, I would agree to that, but he also described, uh, he also described, uh, you know, events that only only somebody who actually participated in the killings could know about. They did not have the results of uh, the luminol testing for blood traces at the time. So uh, later, later on, later on, for instance, they got some luminol results, and it showed that indeed what Jesse described is, for instance, where the killings took place is where the killings took place. Uh, he described. Uh, one boy being mutilated, and he described the, the the nature of the wounds very exactly, and and uh, that was not public knowledge at the time. Where would he have gotten that information, unless he was there? Right. So he he exhibited special knowledge. Damien Eccles also exhibited special knowledge, uh, saying that one boy had been mutilated more than the others. That is not what was out in the media at the time. Right. It was a newspaper story. At the newspaper I worked at at the time, Commercial Appeal, that all three boys had been sexually mutilated. Damien Eccles said only one had been mutilated, it was, and he was mutilated. And there was, he had more mutilation than the others. Uh, he had no way of knowing that at the time. He testified when he got to court, among the many other lies he told in court, he testified that uh, he'd read it in the newspaper. They said, well, you know, here's, here's what was written in the newspaper. Show us where you see that. Yeah. And he couldn't do it. He had to acknowledge he told a lie then. He, you know, he had to acknowledge other lies and deceptions that he also had, uh, pre was presenting to the court at the time. So we get to Jesse's confession, <clears throat> which there was a, there's a lot of mis or misinformation, like you said, that it wasn't a 12 hour interview and uh, he wasn't um, there without parents knowledge. His dad was very well aware that he was down there. <coughs> yes. Um, actually signed a form uh, saying, you know, that it was OK to do so. Uh, but he, he was off. Was he offered a lawyer? Well, he was he was off he was read his rights. Sure, right. And, and, the, and the argument is, well, he's not capable of understanding his rights. Look, his father had been to prison, <laughs> yeah. and they both had they both had extensive dealings with police in the past. Jesse had been arrested and was under probation at the time for uh, attacking uh, a, a young a little girl just a few months before the uh, the killings. And uh, he'd also been gotten in trouble on another occasion for attacking another little girl. I think one girl was 11, and the earlier girl was like 8 or 9. So he was a bully, essentially. And uh, the story he gave was that 
J Damien and Jason had invited him to go to West Memphis to beat up some boys, and he went along with that. Sounded good to him. Yeah, and he, given the nature, given the nature of the fact that he was this bully, uh, who particularly liked to pick it on easy targets like smaller children, right? He was perfectly willing to go along with that. Yeah, Jesse had no and qualms what, about beating up little what kids. He, right. What he described, and they all were drinking at the time. He describes drinking uh, uh, most of a bottle of Evan Williams. They were drinking beer uh, when they went to the woods that afternoon, and what he describes. Honestly, it's most, it sounds, just on the face of it, like three teenage bullies uh, luck up on three small children, decide to beat them up, and then they get kind of carried away and the boys get killed. And that's a reasonable interpretation of the crime. I'm not going to even argue with that because that is, is, on the face of it, what Jesse Miskelly seems to be confessing to. What's also strange in the confession, then he goes on to describe, in a somewhat disconnected fashion, he doesn't tie this in with the killings, but he goes on to describe his involvement in Damien's Satan-worshipping cult at the time. And I would argue that J Jesse was not really capable of understanding whatever it is Damien was up to, uh, but I accept that it was clear that if you that Jesse had been exposed to Damien performing some sort of occult ritual at that time on a somewhat regular basis. And so, uh, you know, whether he was specifically worshiping Satan or just, you know, getting in touch with the pagan gods and deciding what sort of human sacrifice he was going to give to them is probably an open question. <laughs> was it true that there was an underbelly? It doesn't make any difference. <laughs> that there was an underbelly of satanic uh, gatherings in uh, West Memphis? <clears throat> well, there's, there, that's the story. And the, the, the prime promulgator of this, the, of this was Damien Eccles. Right. He had been feeding the, this juvenile uh, detention, this juvenile officer in, in Marion. Uh, Jerry Driver, this story for several years because he gotten in trouble for uh, he gotten in trouble for you know trying to tear out the eyes of this romantic rival at high school, but mm, he really got into trouble for uh, running away uh, and uh, breaking and entering and some other and terroristic threatening and some other things in May of 1992, almost exactly a year before these killings. And really come under uh, the scrutiny of the juvenile authorities. Then Jerry Driver had gotten convinced that there was some sort of there was a, quite a bit of occult activity in Crittenden County, which is where this county, uh, the these two cities are uh, located. And uh, and there was some evidence to suggest that he actually had a an occult expert from a uh, so-called, if you want to put it that way, occult police, police occult expert from Little Rock come in and take a look, uh, you know, a year before. There was actually a news story a year before about concerns about this. The person who was doing a lot of the feeding of this information to Jerry Driver was Damian Eccles. He described a cult that had been uh, involved in animal sacrifices that was planning on moving to human sacrifices. And uh, Jerry Driver didn't come up with that with his, on his own. It came from Damien Eccles, the first person to who would describe the killings as satanic or likely satanic killings was Damien Eccles and his answers to police. So, you know, a lot of the a lot of the problems that Damien Eccles encountered as a result of being prosecuted for these crimes, fairly and just, justifiably, I would say, was came from his own actions. Uh, he didn't have to give the kind of answers he gave to police initially in that police checklist, but he did. And he didn't have to describe them as satanic crimes, but he did. And then whenever they get a killing, they get... Uh, uh, a, a teenager who confesses to being involved in the killings and being involved in a satanic cult. Up to that point, there had been 
nothing in the media about occult connections to this crime. There wasn't anything about satanic panic, so-called. Well, when you get you arrest somebody who says they killed the boys, and yeah, I was going to satanic rituals, and then you arrest somebody else who was also involved who says, yeah, I'm a witch, then, you know, what you have in the public is, if you want to call that satanic panic, it's okay. But, you know, I think it's more of a realistic reaction to events. Yeah, so, Jesse, um, as he's giving this confession and he's drinking that bottle, uh, he you know, he's talking about drinking the bottle of Evan Williams. One of the most uh, fascinating points for me that I heard from you on another interview that you were doing when you were talking about this case was that uh, he took off before uh, Damien and Jason did because he was kind of disgusted at what was going on. Is that is that correct? That's his description, yes. And as he's leaving, he's upset, and he breaks his bottle of Evan Williams on an overpass. Yeah. He breaks the bottle and tells this to his lawyer. Is that correct? And the lawyer says, well, is there, we should go out there and take a look. Actually, actually what happened, what happened was he was convicted in, in 1994. Damien and Jason were convicted in 1994. Jason, uh, Jesse was convicted largely on the basis of his confession. The day he was sentenced, he was, he was being transported to prison there were a couple of deputies that were transporting him. He confessed again to them. His attorney hears about this, Dan Stidham, and says, well, I need to talk to you and get this straightened out. So he goes in, he uh, takes a, he uh, goes in and talks to J- Jesse briefly, comes back out. This is a tape recorded. He comes back in with a Bible. He goes back out and gets a Bible, has Jesse place his hand on a Bible, and has him confess to him, and he confesses to him. And in, in very, 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 very similar stories, what he's already told. This will be at least the third time he's told this story to some sort of fish capacity. I love the Bible. Like that's some. Like that's gonna make make him believe it. You have to consider he's a simple. He's a pretty simple minded guy. He's well, not smart. Oh, I'm talking about the lawyer. I'm like, <laughs> what? Hey, man, if you swear on the Bible, but if you don't swear on the Bible, uh, you didn't do it. Like, come on. I mean, it's just such 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 a weird. Like, it, it, was it aesthetically pleasing for him to see that he's like, oh, he put his hand on the Bible. It must be true. Like, come on. I think he rightly uh, apprised uh, Miskelly's. Uh, mentality yeah. and that Miskelly would find that binding somehow <laughs> uh, yeah. and not that he wouldn't lie if he had his hand on the Bible. Yeah. Uh, what happened uh, pretty much pretty soon after that was Jesse decided he wanted to speak to prosecutors. So, and confess to them. And so they call his defense attorneys in uh, because of the nature of this confession the, the defense attorneys beg him not to confess. He goes ahead and confesses anyway. He says, I want something done about it. During this confession, he describes the incidents, the incident with the uh, Evan Williams bottle that he broke under the underpass. And by the way, Victoria, William, uh, Victoria Hutchison bought that whiskey for him. She, They call her and say, you would remember buying a whiskey for Jesse that day? Oh, yeah. Yeah, do you remember the brand? <coughs> she says, I can't think of it right now. Oh, yeah, it was Evan Williams. <laughs> yeah, and Evan Williams so, has a very distinct bottle. Right, so they go look. They go to the underpass. They look around. It's at night, so I guess they had flashlights. And uh, they find this shard. They go to the liquor store. There's plenty of liquor stores in West Memphis. Uh, whatever, how they want to characterize this as some sort of uh, uh, Salem, Massachusetts, in the, of the South, it's not. But anyway, they went to the liquor store. Uh, they went around and compared the shard to all these other bottles. And what did it? What did it match? The Evan Williams bottle. Right. And then uh, Jesse's Miss, Miss Kelly's attorney St- Stidham said, "You know, if, if this is a match, then I'm gonna I'm gonna believe that he actually did it." Well, 
he's confronted with the evidence instead of going where the evidence goes. He says, well, you know, I'm not going to do that. There was at least one more confession to prosecutors that we, I don't, I haven't seen a transcript of, I haven't seen a recording of that was made after that. So Jesse Miskelly uh, confessed over and over and over again uh, on official capacity. There were also unofficial confessions that he made to friends and so forth that are also mostly on the record uh, that, you know, bolster this idea that, you know, his confession was valid. His, his, story, his story was also very consistent with the, with the exception in the first confession that uh, the boys, that about the times he said that he arrived there in the morning, and then he said he arrived there at noon, and he, they didn't arrive there in the morning, and they didn't arrive there at noon. They arrived there at 6 or 6.30 in the evening. And also that the boys were tied with rope. There's no evidence showing that they were tied with rope. They were. There is evidence showing they were tied with shoestrings. Miskelly later said that he was telling this to police to throw them off the track or something. And I, I mean, he is confessing, but he's also wanting to minimize his own involvement. And I suppose he's hoping for some sort of out. And I guess he thought changing the times would be a really smart thing to do when in fact it's really one of the stupidest things you could do because it was so easily disproven there you know there are other things he could have other details he could have thrown in if he wanted to somehow confess and still get away with his role in it that he could have he could have done that not easily but he he could have done that but he didn't do that because he's not smart no he's not smart no so he thought this was a really bright idea apparently and so, so, and that, that, and so, when people talk about his confessions, they talk about those things. They also talk about him being so compliant. <coughs> and if you actually read the number one, he insisted over his uh, attorney's objections in the, in one of the uh, one of those confessions that he's going to confess no matter what. He's also insisted on confessing to his his uh, defense attorney over the Bible. Uh, he. Resist a number of suggestions in his original confession. They ask him, "Did you go in a car?" No, I, we didn't go in a car. You know, etc. There are a number of instances <coughs> where he he does not follow the so-called suggestions or leading questions. So, you know, the idea that he's just simply parroting whatever the the officers feed to him is is not credible. It's also not credible that a guy who his IQ, I, I'm going to accept it as IQ 72, which is really low. Uh, the, the idea that his IQ is, uh, set, the guy with 72 IQ is going to memorize the story that the police feed to him in the hour and a half or so before they start recording and get, get it all back in, in the kind of shape that it's in, uh, where it's a very consistent sort of story, makes a lot of sense. Uh uh, no, dis- no discrepancies, no really wild s- statements beyond the time and the rope. Um, that you know somehow he he just w- was just fed all that information and then spewed it back. It's just not credible. He's not that smart. And, and what I'm looking at, you say seventy three. It's well below average as terms for IQ, but he is not, as they pointed out, he was not mentally retarded. I mean, that's that's false. Uh, his lawyer asked one of the detectives on the stand, like, do you have any training, you know, for um, working with mentally retarded, you know, people? And he said, no, I don't. And, and they said, did you, were you aware that he had a mental handicap? And he says, I was not aware of that at the time uh, because well, it didn't seem well, like can, he I can, was. I can tell you the officer, the officer that he, they were talking to, Mike Allen, is the sheriff of Crittenden County now. Now, I knew him back right. I haven't been in Crittenden County in quite a while. I mean, I've been out of that business, out of the newspaper business for about six years. But he, he had just been elected sheriff when I was down there. And so I know the guy. And he's he's very honest, very credible guy. And I will tell you that a lot of the and he would tell you this too. I think if he were being sincere about it, a lot of the people that he they deal with, aren't very smart, and they are not well spoken, and they don't have high literacy skills. 
So Jesse Miskelly's presentation would not have been much different than a lot of the other people they were dealing with. Very poor, very uneducated uh, trailer park area, correct? Well, some of it is. Yeah, a lot of it is. Well, where they were from, I would imagine. Yes, yes, and 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 I would say they're they're big they're real problems with poorly educated, even low IQ people from a number of communities around there. Yeah. Based on my own personal dealings with them, and I'm not trying to run them down. That's just the way it is. And drugs and alcohol were a problem as well. Drugs and alcohol, and it's amazing the number of uh, people who are involved in this case who pop up who have uh, uh, sexual abuse of children, mental illness. There was a chronic, uh, uh, chronic, chronic pedophilia. Particularly, there was at least one guy who was that they talked to, who James K. Martin, who really sounded like he could be a viable suspect that nobody ever even talks about, but he was a particularly creepy pedophile, a uh, convicted guy, and uh, he's still around somewhere, I think. I haven't checked on him lately, but he's still on the list. That's not good. Last I checked. Yeah. Is he, was he a convicted uh, pedophile? Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, that's all public information, too. Um, yeah, and, and, he, and uh, he's had a family member who rec- recently who, who was claiming recently on social media that there was ongoing. There had been ongoing uh, assaults against this particular person, yeah. and I'm not even going to say much more about that because it's kind of a violation of privacy and totally, so forth. Totally. Even understand. though they weren't they weren't very private at the time, but I'm not going. Yeah. I'm not going to do that. Sure, no, I understand that completely. Um, so, so Jesse gives this. Jesse in total, what do we have? About seven full confessions and nine. You know, partial totals. Yeah, because there's some conf- there's some to- there's some confessions that he gave that aren't to police or as an attorney, but are I would consider to be confessions. Yeah, and uh, also he um, he you can read uh, transcripts of his his consultations with his attorney over the summer uh, after he was arrested. At no point are they talking about, oh, well, you know, I gave a false confession. You've got to get me out of this. I didn't do this. It's all about, well, you know, they're talking as if he's guilty. What are we going to do? About September or so, they came up with the idea of the false confession, and that's when suddenly that became uh, the, 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 the defense strategy. Up to that point, they really didn't have much of a defense and and it's only actually I'm surprised it took them that long because it's really the only I mean the guy confessed I don't know what, what else they could they didn't have anything else to really defend him with so you know it seems like a pretty obvious defense but uh, Dan Stidham didn't do him well uh, at trial I want to I want to mention that you know uh, people have claimed that uh, these three killers all have alibis. None of them do. None of them have credible alibis. Not one of them. Not one of them. No. Damien Eccles had two attempted alibis. One they tried at trial and concerning a visit to a family friend, a family friend's home that he supposedly went along with his family on this visit. That was disproven at trial on the basis of the girl, the, the primary witness to this visit, claiming that it occurred right before her boyfriend's concert and her, the boyfriend's concert was two weeks later instead of just a day or two before. Uh, the other, his other claim, and they didn't present this at trial for a very good reason, was that he was talking on, on the phone to girls all that evening. Well, the problem is, is there's four girls that he talked to that evening quite possibly. I would say that's true. Uh, you could argue about one of them, whether she, he actually talked to her or not, based on some of the statements. Uh, but Heather Clyatt, it's not, you know, she gets mentioned sometimes and sometimes doesn't. But it's clear he talked to Jennifer Bearden, he talked to Holly George, and he talked to Dominique Tier on May 5th. He didn't talk to any of them between uh, 4.30 or so in the afternoon 
until at least 9.20 that evening and possibly quite later, according to their own statements, including the repeated statements over periods of many years. None of them offer a phone call alibi to Damian Nichols for that time. I hear 10.30. He still uses that as his alibi. Right. And it's and and, and there's some and there's a little problem with the uh, sighting at nine thirty by the Hollingsworth family being at nine twenty and and he talking on the phone to Jennifer Bearden at that time and in fact she later says well you know we probably were talking later uh, didn't you know I didn't want my mother to find out I was talking to Damien Eccles she this girl was twelve and she considered this eighteen year old with uh, a pregnant 16-year-old girlfriend to be her boyfriend, which is creepy in and of itself, and he's talking to her every day. Well, but that's, anyway, that's pedophilia in itself. <laughs> it's I it's mean, pretty pretty close to it. Well, I mean... He was, also, you, he was also involved in stalking. He, we have several instances where he was stalking younger children, uh, younger girls in particular, during this that spring of 1993, including one instance where he's crouching in the bushes and moving his hand in and out of his pants in a strange fashion. Yeah, Draw your wow. own conclusions from that. Yeah, just unbelievable. Monster. It's right. Just unbelievable. The, the amount of evidence against, like, just everything points to one direction. And like I told you earlier, I, uh, on on my YouTube, you know, that, that interview with Terry that I did uh, it, it has gained a lot of traction and it's got a lot of views and it's got a lot of comments now. And, right, and a, lot, and a lot of them are going to jump on Terry as being the obvious suspect. Well, that I would say it's, it's 50-50. And, well, good. Yeah, good. So, because there are people that do come in and defend, uh, you know, and they bring up, thing, bring up things like how Damien... Wanted wanted to sacrifice his first child, you know, and and how people run with one. Tr- like I got into a kind of a back and forth with another guy who did something. He his his it was called the real West Memphis boogeyman, and it was about Terry Hobbs. And I I listened to about ten minutes of it, and I said this is ridiculous. I sent him a message. I said I said you did a whole hour and a half show on a on a secondary transferred hair. You're telling me that's what you did. I said, that is irresponsible, and you have done zero research on this. Uh, you're spreading falsehoods. I was extremely upset about it because when I set out to do this, just like you, and I didn't go nearly as deep as you did, but I felt that there was a professional responsibility to tell accurate information the best that I could, and I've even had to make corrections on some of the things that I said, like I said that Stevie's blood was on there. Well, it was Stevie's blood type that was on the necklace. The blood type, is that correct? Yes. Yeah, so, you know, I, I made my own sort of mistakes. The, the blood necklace with that Damien was, Damien Eccles was arrested with. He had, a, wearing a necklace and a, a, an occult type pendant, and it had two different types of blood on the necklace. One, one of the types of blood was his own, which is somewhat understandable. There was also blood on there that could have come from Jason Baldwin, among many, many other people. Yes. And it also matched uh, Stevie Branch. Right. So I made that mistake, and I got I got jumped on by a few people, and I, you know, like I said, I wrote a little disclaimer at the top <coughs> that, hey, yeah. I messed up, but... But to run to run with a a hair, you know, the secondary, you know, we can talk about this another time, obviously. But I, I just felt it, there's so much of it out there, uh, Gary, that that it's almost hard. To, they they will they will defend. They'll follow them to the gates of hell. These 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 people, Damien right. especially. Uh, you could show them a video of them committing these crimes and they'd say it's doctored or uh so it's almost like there's no winning but i got a message from i was actually going to share it with you and i was going to wait till i talk to you again but i got a message from someone that said hey you know i listened to you i listened to your podcast somebody and he had met damien in oregon well after you know this had all happened years later after he was out and free and he said, I'd always been kind of like reluctant about his guilt. And he said, but I went up to him and, but 
he said at the time he believed that he was innocent and he took a picture with him. And he said, I, he goes, after listening to your podcast, I'm sick that I was arm in arm with a killer. And um, he goes, I had no idea that, you know, there was this much against him. And, you know, it's those kind of people that are on the fence that, you know, I really try and reach. The staunch defenders I don't have time for. I really don't. Uh, because it's a nonstop circle with them. You can tell them so many things, Gary, and and it doesn't matter. And I'm sure you've ran into that a hundred times, maybe a million. Somewhere between a hundred and a million. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Some days it seems like a hundred million. Uh, the, the the fact is, is that you know, with with Terry Hobbs, really all they ha- all there is is uh, a hair that may or may not be from him. Yeah, it's not even yeah. certainly explainable by secondary transfer. And not only that, so if hair. You, you could say the same thing for you know. So if you could, if if their defense of the blood is well, it's the blood type. Well, that's just it's the hair type too. You know, I mean, yeah, the the. You know, the, their their arguments, they want things to fit in, you know, they want to fit, you know, a square peg in a round hole. But when it comes to them, they want that, that uh, square peg to fit right into a square hole that they cut out, you know. So right. it, it's, uh, it's such the misinformation age that we are in. And this was years ago. And, thank, and you can thank HBO for uh, – this because it would have never got right. traction because it was an open and shut case. It really was. Uh, well, they they had they made two two of the Paradise Lost movies. The first one they did a little lighter on this. The second one is, I think, to their own embarrass. I, I know to their own embarrassment. Now, the second movie made John Mark Byers the father of Christopher Byers, uh, the adoptive father, but his father recently made deceased. Him, uh, made, he recently deceased. Uh, John John Mark Byers is. He, they made him appear to be the most likely suspect, not on the basis of really any information, but except there was some blood in a, a knife that he gave to HBO. It's it's a weird story, but <laughs> you know the blood blood of the knife could have come from John Mark Byers. It could have come from his son, and it was John. It was Mark Byers' knife, and he didn't do the best explanation handling that. Well, he's not very smart but, either. But but. The the second movie, they just simply make him look to look like this crazed killer on on the basis of no real information whatsoever. Right. And if you actually look at the case record, John Mark Byers has a practically airtight alibi. There's really no way he could. If you look at, at the timeline, there's no way he could have committed the crime. And that information was all there back then. That information was there for the Paradise Lost filmmakers way, way back there. Terry Hobbs, Terry Hobbs has an alibi that the West Memphis Three, none of the West Memphis Three have. It's not as tight as John Mark, as Mark Byers. It's not, uh, you know, it's, he's not, it, his whereabouts aren't fully accounted for minute by minute that evening. But even if you, re, if you listen to, for instance, Bob Ruff's interview that he did with David Jacoby, who is Terry Hobbs' alibi for that evening. If you listen to that, you have to go, when would Terry Hobbs been able, all these times he was tra- dropping in on, day- on Jacoby, dropping back out, going out and looking, they're driving around very slowly all around the neighborhood that evening, when would he have had time, not to mention, let's leave aside motive and, and uh, means, but when would he have had time to actually have committed these crimes? And covered it up. And it just simply doesn't exist. Well, it's true for uh, Eccles, for Miskelly, and for Jason Baldwin. Their whereabouts are not accounted for that evening. Well, they had time. They did have time. And they had motive. Yeah. I mean, it, that's that that's the, the frustrating part about discussing this case with people who aren't, you know, really up on it. Gary, you know a hundred times more than me about this case, yet the people that I talk to, I know a hundred times more than them because they have done, uh, all they've done is watch Paradise Lost, the the trilogies, uh, and if you were to just watch that, uh, I could see how you would reasonably think that 
there was a lot of problems in this case. Uh, it's such a discredit to th that police department because I think that they did, I think that they did a great job. Were some mistakes made, of course. I was, you know, some things misinterpreted and and you know they, hindsight they is twenty twenty. They made mistakes. Yeah, I, but who does? I've been looking at I've been looking at some other criminal cases lately, and a lot of these big criminal cases, particularly when you talk about a small police department and they get a case that's that's just way outside their experience, they're going to make some even fairly major mistakes just because they really don't know how to deal with it. However, the West Memphis Police Department did as thorough and as professional job as they knew how to do at the time. There was no, nothing there that was criminal or corrupt or even incredibly stupid, as people allege over and over again. You could argue they. I, I would argue it, it's been argued, and I would agree they should it should have interviewed. Uh, for the record, the parents at the time just to get some more information. Uh, that would have been good just for information gathering, and it would have cleared up a lot of questions later on. But I'm not going to fault them for not doing that. I think that they were tippy toeing around interviewing the parents because the parents were so devastated by all this, they just felt like they needed to do that out of consideration. Yeah, you know, I understand. I understand that. Even though I, I do wish they'd talked to them, they did. They did inter interview Mark Byers in particular that month and got some good information from him. I mean, if you read that interview, you, you get a sort of a better understanding of some things going on w with that family and so forth. So uh, it's, it was helpful to them in ways they probably didn't even realize at the time. You know, you know, Gary, I, I did, uh, you know, we don't have to discuss this. I just want to tell you what, so I did a, I did a show the other day on the Breonna Taylor situation uh, I I had no opinion about the what happened, but what I did was I sifted through all the you know misinformation that was out there, and what I did was I presented a very accurate telling who's who, what happened here, why did this happen, what's the legality of this, okay, and then I let people make their own decision. The problem was even if somebody were to go Google what really happened they're not going to get the right story right away because there's so much misinformation on both sides. There is a smear campaign from every angle and that started well before with the, this to me, this is kind of the first case where it ha it had national attention and international attention, got the ball rolling on let's do, let's, Let's go after the victims and let's defend the accused. Uh, I think you're right about that. Uh, it, it, I can think. Of, I can think of some other cases where they they're, they're, they got inter. You have to go back away. What had there was international attention, but it, it, but I I don't think I can't think of another case where the families. And there it may have exist where the families of the victims turned out to be the where all the finger pointing eventually ended up, and so that they were victimized twice over. Right. Uh, you know, they lose a child and then they get blamed for something that there's no evidence they're even involved in. And, and whether or not that they were good people or not, that that's not what we're discussing. That's not the. It was easy to point fingers back because they go, well, look at their past. Well, look, you want to talk about people's past. What what in it? What in Terry Hobbs's past? What in John Mark Byers's past? To, uh, even points towards, you know, homicidal child, you know, killings and sacrifices like that. It didn't fit. But at the same time, you can you can smear people because maybe they're not, you know, they're they weren't Boy Scouts. You know what they I mean? They weren't pristine. Neither one of the neither one of them were pristine. No, and I think I think Terry has admitted, you know, hey man, I had my problems, but Jesus Christ, guys, uh, you know, I I, I know Terry yeah. per personally, you know, decently, you know, we have a 
you know, a texting kind of conversation, you know, relationship. And I, and I have no opinion about the guy one way or the other, except I do not believe that he did this. Uh, and, and I'm convinced of it. Uh, he's certainly no sexual psychopath no. or a child predator or anything like that. No, he's not. Uh, and and if, if he was, it, it would have been pretty obvious at this point. Correct. And, uh, and this, Mark Byers had, he was like a really inept drug dealer. And other than that, he was, and, and he was kind of a loud mouth and he showed a lot of poor judgment. Other than that, he's probably an okay guy other than like these grievous faults. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, uh, so I know we're running short on time and, and I do appreciate you doing this. I would ask though that maybe we can do another another show here in the next week or so because I have questions that I've been asked, you know, that I want to ask you that I want you to answer for me because I think you'd be better at explaining it. Okay. We can do that. I, you know, we, I, I will say we just barely tapped the surface on this. This oh. is a very complicated case hey. and uh, there are a lot of things that go into it. And to explain anything in detail takes up far more time than we have available to us today. Well, it's funny that you say that because I, I do want to say, and I, ha- and I have subscribed and I have been listening uh, to your podcast, The Case Against, on, I believe it's on Apple. Is it also on Spotify? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's on Apple. It, I don't think it's on Spotify, but it, it's on Podbean. Yes. So... And it's, uh-huh. it is so detailed, uh, you know, I mean, it is, it's fantastic, but I would like you to come, I think we could do probably two or three more uh, interviews or, show, uh, you know, discussions to where we can finally kind of, you know, get the, like you said, we barely, we, we haven't, we haven't talked about the Alfred plea, we haven't talked about um, uh, the no. trials, uh you know, and those are two things that I really want to cover. And then maybe at the end of that, I can ask or I can ask you these questions that people are asking me. Um, that way we can, you know, you can kind of help me answer them because you're the expert and I'm not. OK, uh, we can do that. Yeah. And what I'll do is I'll, I'll just send you a list of the questions before so you can have them, you know. Oh, that would help. that would be helpful. Yeah, I'm not. I don't want to put you on the spot and be like, "Hey, was it?" That's not. I, I just want to answer the questions, really. Well, well, generally speaking, I I hate to say I know all the answers, but assuming I have some sort of context for the question, yes, so that I can understand what's actually being asked. Definitely, I, I can usually I can usually I usually know. Sometimes I have to dig around in this old head of mine to figure out where the answer is, <laughs> but I usually know somewhere in there what the answer actually is. Well, absolutely. Well, that's... And, some, and, and some things I don't know. That nobody knows. Well, that's another thing about you that I do appreciate is that you you are you are completely objective about this case, um, and and you didn't have an agenda when you started looking into this, and, and that's the thing that I try and tell people as well. They're like, you know, you already had your mind made up. Well, that's just not true. I didn't. I never, I didn't have my mind made up until I looked into it, and it didn't take me very long. Um, and I, I have been objective about this case, and uh, I have went in completely unbiased. And you did the same thing. And if you, if something you don't know, you just flat out say, "I don't know that to be true. I've heard it, but I, you know." And I do appreciate that. And um, and your book, like I said, I want to tell people again the 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 case against the West Memphis Three. Um, you can get it on Amazon, and uh, it is it is terrific reading um and you're so detailed about it and and i feel like we're kind of fighting a good fight here uh because people didn't really stick up for these parents man and these kids when when this stuff was going down you know i mean and and they deserve it they did they deserved better because this is one of the most horrific crimes that you could you know, that you could commit against children. I, you know, the Chris Watts case comes to mind, you know, that, uh, another completely tragic and horrible, you know, what it, what, I, I just watched, I just watched the Netflix I did too. show the other day. I and I, I have to say, I, I, I literally almost threw up. At <laughs> one point. Uh, and yeah. I, I, it takes a lot to make me do that, but 
Yeah. I almost did. Those, it was that horrible. Those poor so, little baby girls. Man. Yeah, exactly. You know, exactly. We, we, I don't, you know, we don't have to get into the discussion of it, but the, the whole thing about, you know, her asking her if she was going to do that to her, asking her dad, you know, and mom's laying in the in the floorboard and wrapped in a sheet <laughs> face down. I was just, I was telling somebody, that is an absolute nightmare situation for a child you couldn't be more terrified um, as a child I just it's just it's it was so hard to watch but things like that with kids are difficult you know they're they, they it's so much worse when it's children Gary it's so much right. worse because they have no, they have no agency they have no they have no control it's not their choice yeah, and you can say that true for many other crime victims but with children, De facto, they had no choice in the matter. Yeah, and um, so what we'll do is uh, let's set up another time, and we'll we'll uh, we'll we'll talk about the trial. We'll talk about the Alfred plea. We'll talk about things in between that as well. But subscribe to uh, the case against on Apple and uh, Apple Podcasts and Podbean. It is fantastic. Okay. Uh, Thank you, Josh. Gary, well, thanks a lot, man. We'll we'll be in touch, and uh, this will okay. be up uh, here in a couple hours. Okay, enjoyed it. Thanks. Uh, Thanks again. Thank you.